Hello, hello, hello. Good afternoon from Maryland. Thanks to you everyone for being here and joining us this afternoon. My name is Phil Panzarella. I'm the Chief Growth Officer of Easter Seals, DC, Maryland, and Virginia. And I myself am a veteran of the United States Army and a soldier for life. As you know, tomorrow we celebrate Veterans Day. It is a day for us to celebrate the bravery and sacrifice of all our men and women who have worn the uniform in service to our country. I had to share that with you because I know tomorrow is such an important day for a lot of us on this, on this call. So for the last five months, Easter Seals has been hosting these candid conversations, webinars focused on informing and creating a space for, to discuss various important issues impacting our community. Today in celebrating, in celebration really of our Cohen Clinic on its third anniversary. So the Stephen A. Cohen Military Family Clinic at Easter Seals and in recognition of Veterans Day, as I mentioned, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to our Serving Our Military Families Candid Conversations, where we will focus on how to manage caregiving, mental health, and employment stress. As you can probably imagine, these are all timely topics. Today's webinar is made possible by our sponsors, Patriot Apps and Thundercat Technologies, both veteran-owned businesses, and we thank them and their leaders Bob Eisminger and Tom Deerline, who are both fellow veterans and West Point grads for their service and their support. Before we get started, please take a moment to answer the poll questions you see in front of you. I hope you find this conversation meaningful and thank you for showing your support for Easter Seals and for tuning in. Now, I'd like to hand this over to our moderator, She's a longtime Easter Seals friend and a champion for military spouses and families. She is the spouse of General Retired Norty Schwartz, former Chief of Staff of the United States Air Force. Please join me in welcoming Susie Schwartz. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it's my pleasure to be here today. It's an honor to moderate this great panel. I was saying earlier that I'm not sure I, I live up to this panel, but uh, I'm really happy to be here. I look forward to it. I have to tell you, I almost forgot that tomorrow is Veterans Day. I've been uh, decorating for Christmas and oh my goodness gracious. So I'm kind of out of touch and ahead of the game uh, moving on into um, to Christmas. I wanna remind you all, please, if you haven't to participate in the poll, really. Uh, we will look at those results later uh, in the hour. So thank you all. So it's my pleasure now to introduce these great uh, people on the panel. Um, and I'm going to have to read it because I want to make sure that I get their uh, bios uh, correctly. They'll be short ones. Don't panic. I'm not going to read a, a page on each one. But I'm starting with Julie Riggs. She's the National Capital Region Chapter Director uh, for Blue Star Families. And I love Blue Star Families. She's been working with uh, military veterans and families for, uh, in the private sector for 12 years. She uh, has a long history of working with the USO, National Military Families Association, and serving together. Next is Dr. Caitlin Thompson. Caitlin is the Vice President of Community Partnerships at the Cohen Veterans Network. A licensed clinical psychologist, she was most recently Executive Director of the VA at, for Suicide Prevention. And I just have to say thank you for that. Just thank you so much. Next, from as, if anybody can't tell, from Hawaii, uh, Sergeant Major <laughs> Anthony Spadero, a recently retired, very recently retired Sergeant Major of the United States Marine Corps at the U.S. Indo-Pacific Command. Did I say the command correctly now? Perfect. Great. Um, he joins us, joins us from the Robert Irvine Foundation, where he serves as Vice President of Development and Special Projects and to focus his attention on empowering and assisting military members, veterans, and their families. And I just have to say, I love Robert Irvine for many, many reasons. So thank we you. We all do. That. Yeah, thank you so much. Aloha. And now we have Dr. Annika Vandenbroek. I think I said that correctly. I practiced all day. Uh, is the Senior Vice President and Executive Director of the Stephen A. Cohen Military Family Clinic at Easter Seals. She's a board certified licensed clinical psychologist with 20 years of experience working with military service members in the treatment of PTSD, depression, anxiety disorders, and other behavioral health disorders. Welcome everybody. 
Okay, here we go for a nice chat. I hope we make it casual. Um, I'm not a very serious person. I like to be casual. So I like to he hear other people give the good answers and that's what we're looking forward to today. I know they have wisdom to share with all of us. So I'm gonna ask a question, just a general question, a couple of questions for each of you and then we'll have more specific questions. Can each of you say a few words about what's being done at your organization and maybe even tell us or recommend a way to talk to a loved one about mental health or how to make a mental health referral. So uh, Julie, can I just start with you? Sure, thank you so much for having me here. Um, as um, Susie said, I am with uh, Blue Star Families. I am the National Capital Region Chapter Director. And we're a 501c3 that empowers military families to thrive by identifying challenges and implementing solutions, partnerships, and connections to create a strong military community. We build our communities through the implementation of programs and um, uh, resources designed to address challenges and needs that we identify in our annual military family lifestyle survey. The survey really provides a snapshot for us of the state of military families um, and it offers critical, critical insights and develop data to help inform our national leaders, our communities, um, our funders, everybody about you know what's going on with our military families. Um, we use this data on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's a little bit about what's going on at Blue Star Families. Um, I think when I to recommend how I would recommend speaking to a loved one about mental health and making a referral, I'm certified as a mental health first aid instructor, and I really believe that before people sit down for that conversation, which can be a difficult conversation at times, or maybe one that you haven't broached before, um, coming to it with an idea of an understanding of what's available in terms of resources, what's available in terms of um, um, programs, and starting the conversation with that information. Um, arriving to that conversation that way you and you feel like you can um, increase it increases your confidence excuse me and it also makes the person who you're speaking to really feel that they are that what they are experiencing can be dealt with that what they are experiencing has a path to wellness associated with it and and your confidence in that would make the conversation go much more easily um, and then finally I'm a huge proponent of the Stephen A. Cohen Military Family Clinic at Easter Seals. I am. A, um, I have referred people to it professionally. I have referred family members to it personally. I really believe that the services that are there are available um, to a whole host of people. And I think some of our active duty military families might not realize that they too qualify for these services. And it's just such a wonderful um, way to receive services by a very caring group. Um, I also have to put a plug in for my former employer serving together, excuse me, um, they have, if you reach out and you um, discuss the needs that you have, they will refer the person, service member, family member, whoever to um, the appropriate resources in their communities. Thank you, Julie. I wasn't really familiar with uh, serving together. So thank you. Just when you think you know them all, um, you don't. So Anthony, same question to you. Yeah, you know, aloha and first off, happy 245 years of being a United States Marine Corps. It's our birthday today. So, you know, there's a little bit of a birthday celebration that needs to go on. And, and Happy and birthday. You know, it's great. And, you know, we bookend it with Veterans Day just so we don't forget. So, you know, you got to give credit to the Marine Corps sometimes, you know, that, you know, we kind of know how to do a celebration. We go for a two day celebration. So. Happy birthday to all the Marines out there and, and, you know, continue to remain Semper Fidelis. And let's talk about Always Faithful. And that's with, you know, I have to go right to the plug to the Robert Irvine Foundation. And the reason why is, you know, how Robert Irvine, the Robert Irvine Foundation is empowering people. And tonight, folks, after you get done with this great Easter Seals Foundation uh, candid conversation, nine o'clock Eastern time, Robert Irvine's holding his virtual concert fundraiser for our military veterans and our first responders. And there's so many cool people. You know, you gotta look that he's gonna have Justin Moore, Craig Morgan, Mark Roberge of Orr, and Kelly Pickler. And Chef Irvine himself is gonna be hosting this. So get on over to the Robert Irvine Foundation site. I think your guys are gonna put it up nine o'clock tonight. But why is Robert doing this? Again, like Easter Seals, Robert has devoted himself tirelessly to support as a veteran himself, our veterans, our active duty, our first responders, 
and their families to not enable like Easter seals, but empower families and, and, and the work he's been doing. And also he's an honorary chairperson of Easter seals and why this is Robert's way of giving back. And Robert brought me onto the program and this is how he's giving me, I think a second life of how to continue to serve about my journey though, is, is folks, I'm not afraid to tell you that I had to seek help. And that was a tough one. 35 years of serving in every climb and place, I had to get help. And how did I get help? It's a friends reached out to me and two very dear senior people in the Department of Defense sat me down last year and said effectively, dude, you need to talk to someone. Folks, the people are out there and I was reticent. I went there hooking and jabbing, but when I went to talk to get help while still in uniform, it assisted me in this transition now to continue seeking help because folks, it's okay to not be okay. And so many of us, it's, it's before you might've been considered a para and there's still people out there that have stigmas to this. And by this and by getting this word out, if I could help just one more to say, it's okay to not be okay and get the help they need, you're gonna thrive out there. And I hope we talk about more how we could help our precious veterans, their families, our first responders to thrive. So I, I, this is such a privilege to be associated with this and to get that message out. So thank you. Thank you so much, Anthony. Thank you very, very much. Annika, over to you. Sure. Um, so thank you again for everybody who's here. So at the Stephen A. Cohen Military Family Clinic at Easter Seals, we're one of the CVN um, network clinics. There's a network of 19 clinics currently open um, across, the, across the country, and we're focused on providing evidence-based mental health services to every member of the military family, regardless of discharge status. Um, three of our locations, including this, our location, are also providing services to active duty military members. This includes adult children, um, unmarried partners, um, other members of the household that may be close with that, with that military person, um, and uh, children as well, including not just individual therapy, but family, couples um, therapy are also available as well as groups. And um, as with our association with Easter Seals here, we have a variety of other services for veterans, including the Veterans Staffing Network, which provides employment assistance and um, programs like the Little Warriors Program for Children. Um, so we really try to treat the whole person and, and the whole family and everything that they need. In terms of um, helping someone um, get care. I have to agree with everything that's been said here that, um, and not being afraid to ask somebody how they're doing, that if you see that somebody's struggling, I think sometimes the stigma of even asking steers us away from uh, even inquiring into how somebody's doing. But when somebody's struggling, they are likely to perceive themselves as being a burden to other people. So it's really important to take the opportunity to reach out because that person whatever's going on with them may prevent them from reaching out themselves. Um, so be prepared to, to step forward and ask if you see if someone is struggling. And then additionally, to admit um, your, your own experiences and your own struggle goes a, a great ways towards reducing the stigma. That if we saw this the same way we see like high blood pressure, right? Like, you know, um, the, about the same percentage of people suffer from high blood pressure as they do from mental health conditions. And there's really no stigma in talking about the things that you might be doing to reduce your blood pressure. And I, I would love to see our country uh, and our culture get to that same place where this is something you do for your wellness. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Caitlin? Yeah, the, all of the above. Um, but I also, I, I, I think I'd like to just take the conversation and just pivot it just to think about where we are right now as a country in terms of the pandemic and how, what a wacky time it is to be trying to reach out for care. And so like we have, you know, we have these clinics throughout the country. VA has, you know, so many, so many services throughout the country um, and they're brick and mortar. But what I want to really stress is that so many of these places 
places has, have gone to telehealth or online care. And it's exactly the way that we're talking right now, except it's you and your therapist or you and your family member who might need to talk with somebody. It's you and an employment advisor. Um, and I think that for some people that might be scary and kind of weird because we're so used to connecting and seeing somebody's, seeing somebody's just present right, right in front of you. Um, but what I wanna make sure that everybody knows is that the data shows and the research has shown that this still works, that people can get better even through this type of medium. Um, and so while we're all struggling with making sure that we're keep keeping safe, um, really being at home as the numbers continue to go up again with COVID, um, there, it, 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 all is not lost in terms of reaching out for help. And so please make sure that, um, make sure that you're engaging um, as much as you can um, and, and reaching out to family and friends you know, it might not be in person this Thanksgiving, it might be over, over video, it might be over text, but that's still connection. And that's still so important. Thanks. Okay, I'm going to ask a question. Instead of going around every person, I'm going to just kind of throw it out there. What can we do as the holidays approach um, to help people? Can we, you know, do you recommend stuff? Do you reach out more? Do you reach out less? Um, um, just anybody have some ideas specifically related to the holiday season? Got to unmute. You know, you know, Susie, I, I will start, you know, one of the things that I think Annika has done extremely well for Easter Seals is brought all the lessons learned that they learn in the clinic and try to do it with our employees. And so teaches us to be very sensitive about what people are going through. We can't assume that we think everybody's okay, even though they may look okay. And so I do believe that outreach is extremely important because I, you know, like, like most of us, everyone has a challenge in life. You know, sometimes we just don't always admit it. And I think one of the things the military has really taught us was not to be that in tune with your emotion. Nobody really cared about your emotion when they said, you know, go do your push-ups or go, you know, go do that training. It was really about getting the job done, right? So I think this idea of be people being in tune with their emotions and being able to have an open conversation about what they're feeling. I mean, people go through some really trying times and they are scared. And, you know, sometimes there are these personas, like even in my case, uh, I was dealing with a very difficult issue and I thought I was the backbone of the family and I could not admit that I was scared. And until that doctor got me to admit that, you know, it's so I think having the open dialogue and being willing to share your emotions is really very critical. Thanks. Anybody else? Yeah, you know, folks, my dad used to teach me treat every day like it's Christmas and, and don't wait till Christmas to, 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 to reach out to someone. And, and, I, and I think, you know, I, I'm trying to look at all the positives which COVID has brought to us. And, and I think now because of this, people are connecting more. And because people are connecting more, you know, they're reaching out and, and the new normal now via this way. Um, and, and so, I, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to say, do we continue this on? So when COVID is, is eventually we crush it and we fight it and the vaccine's out and people keep wearing masks and people keep expressing, I'm gonna take care of you. What happens after COVID? I just hope this doesn't stop. I hope and that's so. what we need I hope to continue. So. It's, it, it just continue this going. Julie, before you go, I'm gonna ask you next, but um, I, I'm, we're sitting in my craft room and I'll just tell you what I do is I make cards for people. And to my right are about 30 cards that just say hello or hugs or a smile. And I probably spend, I send five of those a week to random um, people for no reason at all. So that's kind of my gift. And then one other thing, this great medium, I reached out to a young spouse and she was feeling lonely in Portland, Oregon. So we, we have a stamping group on Zoom. And I'm telling you, I really think it was the lifesaver for her. Um, her husband was seeking therapy, but not her. And um, I think the stamping group became her therapy. So that's a sidelight for me, a non-therapist. And Julie, your answer, please. Great, thank you. I agree. I believe that uh, Zoom has given us some opportunities to come together in ways that we wouldn't have been able to. Um, being from California, I'm able to see friends and family more easily and support them even from a distance. Um, I could have done it before pandemic, but I didn't think to do so. Um, what I was going to say, though, is as a, as a mom who has a child who um, deals with mental health 
uh, issues that flare up now and then. Um, I think for me as a caregiver, it's very important to understand what those triggers are with my, my own child and to know that when we're going into a situation or a time of year or um, you know, uh, an experience that might get one of those triggers going, um, to really be um, mindful of that and pay closer attention um, and do check-ins and just have that conversation. Hey, you doing okay today? I know this is kind of a stressful place we're in right now, or I know there's a lot of uncertainty. How's that? How is that going with you? And kind of talk those issues down prior to the crisis occurring. Um, that to me is one of the ways that um, I think we can help people during the holiday season is realize the heightened level of tension, especially if maybe they're not able to go to the support systems that they usually go to for friends and family um, during the holidays and just being aware and being opening that dialogue. Again, it's the conversation. Thanks. Okay, let's go to some individual questions. Phil, you're up. Let me see what the question is for you. You transitioned from a military career into a civilian career. Can you speak about that process and what it means to you to be a soldier for life? Got to unmute yourself. Yep, there we go. So thank you, Susie. I appreciate that. So I, you know, when I exited the military, I had 10 years of service and the army and its infinite wisdom was gonna give me a permanent profile to take me out of combat arms. And I decided that was probably not the good thing for me to go do. So, so I was medically separated. And then, you know, there was a ton of anxiety. I, 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 tried, I tried the best to just exit and start on my own. I, I didn't care about any of the opportunities for training or any of those other kinds of things that quite frankly, probably weren't as robust as they might be right now, which, you know, is, is, is a big improvement. So I, I was pretty anxious to just get started, but boy, I did not know the art of transition. Um, you know, and, I, and the amount of research and preparation that you needed to do in order to even begin was just un, unbelievable. And I finally learned that. And then one of the things that I, what I thought was instrumental was somebody said, if you can't leverage your family and your friends and your network, then why do you think a perfectly, you know, st perfect stranger would want to help you? And those are the people that will mostly want to help you. And I was trying to avoid them because I didn't want to impose upon them, right? So, so that was an invaluable lesson learned for me. And then the other was informational interviews. I, I didn't know enough about the business world. And you know, somebody said, well, just go do an informational interview with, with those people that have the kinds of jobs that you think you would like to have. And what I found was people love telling you about themselves. And that was just a wonderful door opener for me. And so it allowed me to get good insight into the business world and into specific business opportunities that I thought would be very valuable to me. Um, and then the only other thing I would share was, you know, it was an anxious time. Uh, you know, if you go a couple of months without finding a job, you, the anxiety level goes up. You know, you, at first you think, well, I'll find the job. And then you start thinking about, well, what skill do I really have? I'm a combat arms, infantry ranger, airborne, hua, right? you know, translate that into a skill set, you know, it, it took some doing. And, uh, but once you got going and you figured that first job, then it became a lot easier, right? So, so those are just some of the things that I learned. And one of the other things was an eye opener. I assumed the culture, the professionalism and the values would be the same or better. And I was disillusioned. I, I came, we, you know, the military for one thing, the profession of arms, the culture, the values that was ingrained in us. And, uh, you know, so, it was, it was a little discouraging to get into the business world and see that the that acumen was not there. So those are just a few items for me, Susie. I could probably have a ton more, but I think that gives you an idea. Thanks. Julie, over to you. Uh, what struggles do military families face during transition? Yes, um, well, <laughs> a lot. Um, according to, as I mentioned, the survey that Blue Star Families does, according to our 2019 survey, some of the top stressors for our military families are military spousal employment, um, ch dependent children education, and um, not feeling connected to their communities. Um, so if you, when a new military family moves to, or a military family moves to a new duty station, which is on average three to four, every three to four years for most, they're often faced with an upheaval of all three of those things. And um, so this disruption of stability um, really can cause, you know, a ripple effect through the entire family um, during the, you know, the entire active duty family. 40% um, of our military families don't feel connected to their civilian communities. 
And what we're seeing at Blue Star Families this year especially um, are stories about people who have moved thousands of miles away from any family, friends, network, and they're, they're going to a new duty station only to be in the middle of a pandemic and unable to start building that sense of community and those sense of supports that they've had. So this, this has been a really challenging and strong um, you know, year for our families, especially um, because of that pandemic. Thanks, thanks. Anthony, you're the, probably the most recently transitioned, I think. Um, and how was it for you and your family, that combination of getting the sweet spot for both of you, for all of you? Yeah, no, thanks. It's a great question. And what's been added so far, you know, I got to steal a line from um, our former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Dunford. And I know Ellen Dunford's part of the Easter Seals family. And General Dunford would always tell us, you know, it's not just about relationships. It's all about relationships. And, and Phil, to go back to your point, it's, it's leveraging these relationships. And that's what was, was really aided me. So here, you know, you can't paint all veterans it's by the same paint by numbers. You know, uh, uh, every veteran's a Van Gogh, a Rembrandt, a Matisse. It, it, they're, they're, you just can't lump us all the same. So, you know, trying to look at where these relationships would benefit me is I said, you know what, I don't want a job when I get out of service. I want a position. I just been in it. I really I hadn't worked for 35 years. I got to serve. So how do I translate that same synergy and energies into this next, you know, do over that you're getting essentially. So that was the focus was aligning myself and my values to organizations that would best support me so that I could continue to serve. Well, what does that mean though? Everyone is painted differently. The best advice I could give to anyone is, is, is you know, so many 67% of our veterans, they leave their first job they get into and why, and then the exit surveys are out there. They didn't get the same camaraderie, the same fulfillment. Phil, to your point, they're, they're trying to search for the same things they had in the military, camaraderie, family togetherness, people taking care of one another. So that's why I said there are positions out there though. And if you look for them, you're gonna align yourself these positions and I think you're gonna see the thrive. And that's why Easter Seals with your veteran staffing network, which you're doing, you're doing that now. So you know, bravo Zulu and thank you for that. So I hope that kind of answers that question. It does. Relationships are everything. And I will say that as I deal with young spouses um, and older spouses, I'm not sure relationships, they don't get that yet. Uh, they think it's all about the programs and what can, they can seek, but I keep telling them work your relationships. That's everything. Caitlin, up to you. Same kind of, we're on the same, uh, you know, kind of question, but um, do they, do people seek help when they're transitioning? I mean, do they, do they go to people to ask for help? I mean, not just for the job, but for them, the stress of it. You know, I, I wish they did more. I think that, um, I think that one thing from a suicide prevention standpoint, one thing we know about suicide is that it tends to occur during a period of transition. So this may be during a, during a period of transition from the military. It may be during a period of transitioning by retiring from a, a long time job, um, a transition of a divorce, um, a transition of a, a death of a spouse or somebody else. And so we, we also, we need to be very aware when that happens to ourselves, but it also, we also especially need to be aware as we're going through that journey with other people. And so as they're going through the transition, really talking to your, your friend, your family member and saying, listen, this is not going to be easy. Any transition is hard. We all know this. We all know this from every, every transition that we've all been through. It's the unknown. It's scary. But to say to somebody else, I'm going to be here with you as you go through it. I'm going to hold your hand through this and we're going to get through this together. And that might mean me helping you to reach out and talk to somebody for professional help. That might mean me helping you find a, an employment specialist. Um, it's just get, grabbing somebody and saying, I'm here with you. We're going to get through this together. I think can be of such value. Um, and uh, again, from a suicide prevention standpoint, it can just make sure that that person who is who might be pretty feeling pretty vulnerable at that time doesn't feel alone and feels like not only are there resources available but there's somebody who's going to walk walk together with them to get to those resources 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Anika, we're going to switch a little bit. We're going to switch gears to caregivers. Um, I know that um, there are a lot of caregivers served there with you. And I don't, I'm not aware of, I'm not um, as familiar with the issues of caregivers. Um, and if you could share with us sort of what their issues may be and what we can do to support them in the community. Yeah, I mean, there's tremendous stressors with um, caregiving and, and um, what a caregiver does can vary widely from one family to another. So one caregiver may be providing primarily like emotional support or assistance with organizational household kinds of tasks and we may have other caregivers that are responsible for like assisting with bathing or dressing or things like that. So. Um, there's a wide variety of experiences that caregivers have, kind of like we said, you know, veterans vary and, and um, families vary, but even the caregivers experience can vary widely. We know that it's, it's extremely stressful. We know that caregivers have um, a, their rate of depression, for instance, is about four times what it is in the general population. So it's extremely stressful. And um, our, our clinic has um, supported caregivers by, one, we have culturally informed care. So we have care that's informed by the military culture. We have a lot of staff are veterans. I'm also a veteran. Um, and we have other clinicians who are veterans or, who are military family members, who are spouses and children of family members, so that you have people that really understand um, some of the unique aspects of having served in the military. Um, and then the having reduced barriers and access to care because uh, you know when people are in a caregiver role, their ability to come to appointments and take care of their own needs is significantly impacted. So things like um, the availability of telehealth that we had, we had about 40% of our clients using telehealth prior to the pandemic. Um, it was extremely popular beca because of issues around access, um, access to care, and um, that we provide a variety of services. So people can see, seek individual, they may need family. Oftentimes in caregiver um, relationships, there needs to be some couples therapy because it's stressful and communication challenges arise, of course, for for even under ideal situations, couples can have challenges around communication. But if you add a, care, a caregiver role, if you add um, maybe uh, unidentified or untreated um, mental health issues or PTSD, all of those things um, we wanna be able to address. In addition, we, we um, lean into our relationships with our community partners, like serving together, like Blue Star Families. Um, where we know that information about the services that we have um, make it out to that caregiver community so that they know that they can come to us for that support. Thanks, thanks. I guess there's a question and answer, and I can't see it. Um, I, I see in the chat, but not the Q&A. So we're going to get to that if we can, maybe somebody can send it to me in chat. I don't know why it's not coming up. Oh, maybe it's coming up now. Um, um, but I'm gonna ask another question, Phil. What led you to Easter Seals? Of all those, all the great organizations out there, what specifically about e Easter Seals was attractive to you? You're muted. That's all. You're muted again. Muted. That's a wonderful question, Susie. So thanks for asking it. I just, you know, I, I've been on the board of Easter Seals for about 10 years, right? I was chairman for three, and I was at a point in my life where I was looking to create more value for myself in this chapter of my life in a very meaningful way. And I really needed to get back to work full time and be able to help as many people in an environment, in a culture that I could appreciate and that could resonate with me. It's just like the people on this call, right? We're, we're all very familiar. We all come from the same cultural background. We understand the meaning of give of, of our profession and of being a culture of, you know, giving back to the local community and partnering where it makes sense. You know, so one of the reasons why I joined Easter Seals was there, there was a big movement back in 2008 to do more things with veterans. And I was working with Sergeant Major of the Army, Jack Tilly at the time with American Freedom Foundation. So, you know, we were doing concerts, creating awareness. And then Easter Seals, you know, the couple po folks on the board who I knew, General McNair being one of them, said, hey, why don't you come over and help us with Easter Seals and, you know, see if we can do more things with veterans. And so 
that's the first thing that got in, got in my blood was this, this need to be able to help veterans. And you go back to that question on soldier for life. That's what veterans do, right? It's about creating that network, being a maven, a connector, a salesperson, helping veterans, whichever way you can. Right. So, so that was just one, one part of it. Then the other was children. You know, you talk about the most precious of our society, Easter seals handles children, adults, and veterans. I have two grandchildren. I have a mom who has dementia. My elderly mother-in-law lives with me and I'm a veteran. And I said, you know what? There can't be a better in alignment. And I get to work with veterans and people who care. And, um, you know, so it's just a wonderful opportunity for me to be a part of this organization. And the, and the last piece of it was I needed to be a part of an organization that can deliver with quality and empathy and respect and integrity and care. And that's what Easter Seals provides. Um, and you know, one thing I do have to mention is that Easter Seals doesn't do it alone. It does it with great partners like, like Anthony, like Kate, and like you, Susie and Julie. And you know, it does it with Chef Irvine, who we're recognizing in our advocacy event coming up, right? So, you know, it's it's about partnering for a broader good, for a bigger impact, rather than doing it by ourselves, because no one of us can do it by ourselves especially in this environment moving forward. So I'm delighted to be where I am. It's a great chapter in my life and uh, it's very meaningful for me to be able to be a part of such a wonderful organization. Thanks. Okay, I can see the question now. So here we go. Julie, um, as COVID continues over the winter, what resources do your organizations have for helping military families that will still be unemployed or at risk? Absolutely, great question. Um, Blue Star Families has actually partnered with USAA um, and to help military families affected by COVID. Um, we have um, our pulse um, survey or pulse poll right now um, being active and we are also working with uh, USAA to help in um, getting over $30 million into the hands of military service members and their families who need that because of issues dealing with loss of employment, um, inability to work, illness, that type of thing. I will make sure that uh, in a second, I'll put the link up in the chat um, for people who access that website and uh, go ahead and uh, go through and see if they qualify for the, for the assistance. Um, in addition to that, um, many of our chapters are providing um, events that have, um, are addressing food insecurities, uh, as well as opportunities to, um, really uh, get out and provide uh, access to resources for military families that perhaps with programs that are hurting with funding at the moment. Um, I just did one where I was able to um, have a bunch of children get a bunch of Disney books and um, so that they could have a treat and we did a reading um, experience with that. So just a variety of things, but that our, our work with the USAA is really helping to drive some solutions for some of the financial issues at right now. Thanks. Annika, what, how about you? How, how does COVID affect or what, what services can you provide for people dealing with that? So um, leading aside just the straightforward mental health services, right, because that's always available. And um, we have case management services uh, where we can assist people with identifying resources for things like food insecurity. We, have the, we also have the Veterans Staffing Network. Um, which has been working really very hard, you know, in this period of time to secure employment when we've seen so many people with, you know, issues around losing their jobs. Um, the case management service is really excellent um, and uh, we have great relationships with the community partners and identifying those resources. Um, so those are some of the things that we're, we're able to provide. Um, and we're always looking for new opportunities and new relationships in the community so that we can continue to sort of have uh, the most available resources um, and um, connections with our community partners for the veterans that come to us in need. Thank you, thank you. COVID gets to all of us, doesn't it? Um, boy, it's getting old. I had people here decorating and I made them wear masks yesterday. And one of my friends was very unhappy that she had to wear a mask. And I'm like, so sorry. Uh, Anthony, in your new life, you've taken on so many different things. There's all kinds of different titles. I could have read them for half an hour. Um, but in all those organizations, whatever, tell us what, um, what do those organizations do for helping people with employment? Yeah, it, you know, awesome. I think what it is now is is like 
and, and I think Annika, you're saying it's best and everyone alluded to this, is how do we align them again? And, and it, it's almost a personality assessment is how do we find them where they're going to feel satisfied again? You know, any, any of the investment that you did in the military, it was an investment of your life and it's a different type of investment. Um, and, and, and all too well, you know, Mrs. Schwartz on that investment because of the family investment as well. So it's taking, and I said, you know, the, the, the comment here on the whole family here is how do we identify that and align them to this? I mean, that's the things where I, I jumped on to some of these organizations. There's one called Four Block and Four Block's an incredible one, how we assign mentors to our transitioning veterans. And it's not to get them jobs, but to align them to positions where they'll thrive. So I think we need to identify that. And that's one of the things trying to work with HR representatives now to understand who this military veteran is um, and, and what are they gonna bring to the table? And we all know so well what they can bring and the depth they can bring. But it's also the military person taking responsibility. And, and, and I don't want to enable. And it's very easy to enable. It's empowering. I, you know, that's why I'm super excited that Dr. Biden will be sitting soon over at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue because the programs that they in place when she was with Mrs. Obama were incredible for how we're getting even our spouses. Because this is what we also found. If you have that dual network of the spouse that's empowered, then everyone's unbeatable and mental health issues are, are somewhat alleviated to a point. So that's why I'm kind of excited where we're gonna see the changes soon coming because we're now we're gonna see this duality because I'm really afraid folks of a lot of the good programs that are government led, if you don't use it, you lose it. So thank you to Easter Seals and the veteran staffing networks and USAA and all these programs, the Robert Irvine Foundation for now empowering families again. Thank you. I, I recently judged the military chef and the military aide of the year. And so we sure do miss eating um, Robert Irvine's food at the Ritz Pentagon City. Can I just put in a <laughs> plug for both of those things? Um, a virtual meal is not quite the same. You just... Um, yeah, I know, the, I know the chef right now, he just can't wait to break out, you know, and he wants to give back so much to these families. And, and you know, that we just helped Greg Gadsden. I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with Greg's story and a and, and bunch of the stuff that the Irvine Foundation is doing now to go after and help it. Now, and also first responders. Folks, we got to add first responders now. The military, we were the soup du jour for so long, but COVID now is now given this new look to how critical our first responders are. Thanks, thanks. Boy, we're th the, um, the hour is speeding along. I'm trying to read all this stuff over here, but I'm not quite ready for the results of the poll. Caitlin, I felt like I, I've ignored you for a little while, so I'm just gonna say, um, does the, the DOD or the government, did they reach out to private organizations? I mean, I know I, I'm throwing you a loop here. Maybe it wasn't on the list of no. questions. <laughs> no, of course. I, you know, I think that I, I actually, I worked at VA as, um, as you said in the beginning, for over 10 years. And so I have uh, pretty strong relationships with our with our government um, partners. And I think that they're doing so super well. I mean, we can always do better, right? Um, but I think that um, as long as you um, are, as long as you know who to who to get in touch with. One of the challenges that I find specifically with DOD is that there's so much turnover because everybody's moving every couple years. Um, so to find that person who is the champion for your organization, I think is, is really important. And to make sure that you maintain that relationship over time, remind them that you exist, that you're there because maybe in 10 months they'll be gone and someone else will be there and you'll have to re redefine that relationship. But um, you know, I think that with VA, um, there, so we can't all do this alone and VA acknowledges that too. And so um, VA has been um, outstanding in terms of their, um, uh, their community engagement boards, um, their CVEBs, um, their Veterans Experience Office under Dr. Linda Davis, I have found to be just phen phenomenal in terms of making sure that VA is engaged as possible. I know Easter Seals is a huge part of that as well um, as Cohen Veterans Network and Blue Star Families and other organizations. So um, certainly we have to just keep keep at it. Um, and uh, But I, I think that those relationships are so important and um, you know, as much as possible, if we can really um, 
really use them to make sure that we're, we're serving our veterans, their families, and our military as well as possible. Thank you. Only thing I wish is I wish the VA had a better cheerleader out there. I'm telling you, I am their cheerleader, you know, behind the scenes, but I feel like they need a more public cheerleader because the work they do is great and they just don't get, I mean, you don't, you don't want credit, but I mean, they just don't get the recognition that they deserve. I'd like to ask everybody watching too, if you have any questions, go ahead and please send them in in the question and answer. And I think we've got some poll um, results coming up here. Um, it's hard for me to look at all of you and look over here at the same time and not wear my glasses. I mean, I mean I'm not being, I'll put them on, but oh, here we go. How are you connected to the US military? Let's see, a veteran. 13%, family member, 38, and I am a supporter, 50%. Wow, I, would have, and not, I wouldn't have thought that. Um, please select all the services. They use the mental and behavioral health, uh, career counseling, 88%, wow. Respite care, 88%, and mental and behavioral health, 94%. Wow, okay. Wow, people are using them, that's a great thing. That is a great thing. We have to continue to pushing out this stuff to the spouses, I will tell you. That's really where the key is. Um, and they're, they, um, I think you all know, they live in the world of their own. And um, so you've got to penetrate them and get, get it where they share it with each other. Um, they don't believe what comes from the VA necessarily. So uh, anyway. You know, Susie, this is Phil. So one of the quick things I just wanted to share is that you know, it, spouses are invaluable, especially military spouses, getting the words out, you, wonderful ambassadors of all the great work that all our organizations do. Yeah. And that's why it's wonderful for you to be a part of uh, and see what we do so that you can share that with everyone around us. You know, one of the things that Anthony mentioned was, you know, emergency responders. I mean, you know, even Easter Seals, we have child development centers that are open right now in center with PPE, face masks, temperature checks, social distancing, and we're trying to enable parents and families to be able to go back to work to earn a living so that they can help the rest of us. So, you know, there, there's a lot of wonderful work on out, and out there. And I think the hardest part all of us as nonprofits have is how do we effectively get the word out? And so we can't thank you enough for being a part of this because without you, you know, and, and the spouses and all the military, you know, spouses and significant others, we, we would not be able to get the word out. So thank you. You're welcome. You, you know, Mrs. Okay, Schwartz. What? Yes, go ahead. And I got a question, and this is where I love your advocacy, is we need you to continue to be myth busters. And, yeah. and that's the problem is that there's so many myths out there. there there's horrible myths about our VA. There, there's horrible myths about the military programs that are out there. I mean, even you look at the DOD schools or the, the education systems out there, and it just, these myths get out there and they grow a legend of their own. And so I, I like to consider myself a myth buster, but what you're doing, Mrs. Schwartz, is bravo Zulu of, of just delineating this, what we're saying about the VA and the programs that are out there. So let's all be myth busters. If there's any message that we can continue to push, is get the myth busting out there, get the true story out there, yeah. and we're gonna get these families involved. Yeah, I think one giant myth buster is that senior leadership cares about you. That is a true statement. And I said that last night to the small book club that I was a part of, and all of them probably 05, 06 spouses in there. And they're like, well, you know, they kind of believe it, but it is true. They honestly do. Julie, I'm going to switch back to you. Just tell us about your experience as a military spouse, as a mother, and even maybe working in, in all that in same environment. Sure. So I am probably one of the more, the luckier military spouses in that because of my professional career, I'm usually aware of the programs and resources in the areas where we've been stationed. However, um, at our last duty station and during a recession, I found myself six months without a job, um, actively looking, and um, it was extremely difficult. Um, I remember going to the commissary and buying a pound of hamburger and cutting it in half and hoping I can get two different meals out of it because the choice was to keep my children in daycare so I could look for a job or and, and then have no money coming in really because twins and daycare who were under the age of three is expensive or take them out of daycare and really, really not find a job. So um, I found myself for the first time ever feeling um, a sense of depression and anxiety. Um, I, 
My husband was deployed at the time. I, I was new to the area. Military spouses really do face quite a lot. And that employment part, if you're seeking employment as a spouse, if you have to restart your network every time your husband or your wife um, do, um, PCSs or moves to another duty station, that can be extremely difficult. And so um, I really, I'm glad that there are programs out there, but like you said, we just need to keep letting our spouses know and get the word out that there are amazing programs that provide opportunities. The Veteran Staffing Network at Easter Seals, Yolanda, big shout out to Yolanda. If you haven't worked with her, she's amazing. Um, um, just a lot of other programs. Um, Blue Star Families has a spouse force program where we work to get military spouses connected to licensure and to, um, um, uh, excuse me, um, uh, certificates and also to employment of people who are ready to work, hire a spouse, even with maybe a gap in their resume or, you know, um, kind of looking like they've done every job under the sun because they've taken a different role at every duty station. <laughs> so it's just so important for us to keep getting that word out and let them know that those resources are available. Thank you. Guys at Easter Seals, you know, I've been to the facility so many times and it's so beautiful. Is anything in person these days at all? Um, any of you? Yeah, so I'll the, start. Okay, go ahead, go ahead, Annika, you could take it. Well, okay, so um, for the clinic, we continue our work is fully remote at this time. Um, Phil mentioned that the Child Development Center is open um, and um, offering in-person services for the CDC. Phil, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, no, I, and I think most of, uh, most of the work we're doing, even around the veteran staffing work, uh, is, is really virtual. Um, I will tell you that we have another employment program called uh, the Homeless Veterans Re Reintegration Program that is doing outreach day in and day out in Baltimore, DC, Northern Virginia, and they're trying to find homeless veterans and help them overcome the barriers to getting employment, whether it's you know some kind of addiction or it's homelessness or it's food or it's whatever it might be. We help them find the training and, and these folks are still out there doing their jobs day in and day out hustling around the neighborhoods trying to find these folks to make sure that we can take care of our fellow veterans and um, and so it's homeless female veterans incarcerated veterans you know so it's anyone out there that you know, we can find from a veteran population so there's some wonderful things that are still going on Susie it's not as easy as as people think it is um, and but we have a, you know a number of really dedicated people who want to see the mission continue thank you you know, in retirement, I watched three wounded warriors um, that were Air Force. And I say, once you retire, I don't have to be, I can't look at all of them. But to people out there, you can pick certain ones and you can just, you know, care about them. So I have one in Colorado, one in Utah, and one in Florida. And I know what they're doing almost at any time. One of them has a podcast and um one time his wife said, you should tell your audience about Mrs. Schwartz. And he said, what do you mean they know about her? And they said, she said, no, I bet they don't. And all she, all he said was, well, she's my angel. And so to everyone out there, you could pick someone to be an angel for. You don't have to do the great big program, right? You could just do a person, just pick them and you can help them, whether it's employment or caregiving or mental health or anything else like that. It's not, it's not hard, right? It's not hard. Caitlin, I feel like we, you haven't said anything. So I'm just going to kind of open up the floor. Do you have anything to share? I haven't asked oh you. Oh my gosh, I feel like I've, I've said here. quite a bit, but oh my gosh, yeah. I mean, I, I think again, I just want to want to quickly pivot back to this very strange time and just make sure that everybody knows that um, even if somebody is in crisis, um, one of the amazing things that the VA has done that I was honored to be a part of for a long time is the Veterans Crisis Line, um, which has been is a 1-800-273-8255. You press one. So even if you are even if you ask somebody the question like we were talking about before that you're concerned about somebody if you're really really concerned about somebody you can call the crisis line and you'll have somebody there available immediately who can help to provide the resources that you might need and to provide that that crisis intervention that that may be needed too um, and i also want to just reflect back briefly on the holiday season um, i think that there is certainly um, speaking of myths one myth that we know is that um, th there's an idea that 
uh, suicide rates rise during the holidays. And that's actually a myth. And in fact, they happen after the holidays. So we don't want to lose sight of that, that, okay, the holidays are over, we're all great, whatever. Um, it's in fact, you know, and I think even more so, we just have to be much more aware of ourselves and aware of each other after those celebrations end and, you know, kind of the winter sets in and especially during during this pandemic. I think that, um, that uh, Annika can probably speak to the fact that um, we're seeing across our clinics a rise in requests for couples therapy and for family therapy. And doesn't that make sense, right? <laughs> um, I, with my husband and seven-year-old who have been, you know, pretty much stuck in this house, love them, love them, love them. But that level of stress is going, you know, is going to continue to be enhanced. And so um, please make sure that you're also aware of services like that too. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, anybody else have anything to share? Just, uh, we're getting close to the end. And uh, as I look at that view in Hawaii, I was just wondering, Anthony, um, has the tr transition been what you thought it would be? Uh, um, no, uh, 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 uh. <laughs> and, and, and yes, you know, and, and again, thank goodness for just people reaching out to me. And, and right when I was transitioning and offering positions, and, and it was Robert Irvine, and, you know, I had a friendship with Robert and, and Robert contacted me in transition and just saying, and, and you all know Robert just went, dude, you're coming to work for me. And, and joining the Irvine Foundation is one of those things that allowed me to thrive and live because all I was doing was translating. All I had to do was take my uniform off and that was it. I was still doing the same things that I was doing essentially in uniform. So, you know, Robert Irvine is not only that he's a savior and, and he saved me in this in the process and, and, and allowing me this. So, this isn't a shameless plug for someone that if you all know Robert and if you've seen him, you know, what you see is truly what you get. And he reaches out to people. I mean, he, he, random people he meet, he's going to tweet with and contact and call. This guy is the energy, the energizer bunny goes to Robert for energy. So that's what I think was really is that having a friend like that, that was my safety shoot. And, and so that's why, you know, I'm, in, I'm endeared to Robert for all this. So it's not just, you know, me sucking up to the boss. This is a true statement on a true person. And, and I think Easter Seals, this is why you have Robert as your honorary chairman for good reason. Right. And Phil, I think we're getting close to the end. So I'm just gonna ask you maybe some, for some final words. I have, I have so enjoyed listening to everybody and I think I learned some things, believe it or not. Um, and I paid attention and, uh, and um, I just, uh, I appreciate everyone's candor in all honesty. That's what I was hoping for, was honesty. These are crazy times. And um, I could sometimes I think I could use that therapy having shared this house with my husband since March. Um, it's not normal to have this person in my house, in my space. <laughs> um, and if you have two type A's living together, that's not always wise. Um, and I am very loud and he is very quiet. So uh, during my Zooms, I notice that he comes up and quietly shuts my door because it's heading downstairs. And we also lived through a giant renovation during all of this, can you imagine? So um, Phil, um, thank you all. But Phil, if you have some final words for us, we'd really appreciate it. Yeah, Susie. So first of all, I want to thank you and this entire panel. You, you are just wonderful. I can't thank you enough for all you do. And I know this conversation was really directed around caregiving and mental health, but there are so many needs out there in our communities of interest. So if you have a passion, you have an interest, please get out there and make a difference. Individuals do make differences and every organization needs your help. So please don't think that one person can't matter because you can. So I challenge you to find that need, need find that niche and, and be involved in any way you can, whether it's just volunteering your time, donating your treasure, whatever that may be, because it will be impactful and will make a difference in the lives of at least one person. So thank you again for all you all do. So thank you. Thank you, please, everybody. Please tune, in. Oh. please tune in tonight for the virtual concert by Robert Irvine Foundation, please. And it benefits Easter Seal. So there's this great duality. And, and what we say here in Hawaii, we mean it to all. Susie, aloha to this esteemed panel. Aloha. God bless you all. And this is just a great opportunity. And, and, you know, tomorrow, remember, you don't have to be tomorrow to call someone. Call them today. Call thank them Thursday. You thank you call all very, very much. And Easter Seals, thank you for asking me to participate. I was thanks. anxious about this. And I enjoyed it more than you can know. So thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank have a wonderful you. day. Aloha. Thank you.
Thank you.